I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a true pleasure to welcome you to today's program with the remarkable Fania Wedro, a Holocaust survivor in Calgary, Canada, who's 94 years young. We owe special thanks to Marnie Bonder and Dahlia Leibin at the Calgary Jewish Federation, who are with Fania today and who are partnering with us to present this program. Fania's story, which you'll hear today, is particularly unique because she and her family experienced an untold chapter of the Holocaust, known as the Holocaust by Bullets. The phrase refers to the mass shootings across Eastern Europe, conducted by Nazi forces and their collaborators between 1941 and 1944. Of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust, approximately 40% were murdered in these kinds of mass shootings. Yet their stories have largely faded into obscurity as contemporary observers have focused on the Nazi camps. Fania has worked tirelessly to bring attention to the Holocaust by bullets and teach future generations about what happened to her community. She follows in the footsteps of people like Father Patrick Dubois, a French priest and Holocaust researcher who has devoted his life to uncovering mass graves and the stories of victims in towns like the one Fania is from. Fania was the recipient of the 2019 Golda Meir Leadership Award from Israel Bonds. And more recently, she was selected by the USC Shoah Foundation as the latest participant in their Dimensions and Testimony program, which will turn Fania's testimony into a hologram. As Fania speaks today, please feel free to share questions for her in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll save time at the end to get to them. Fania, without further ado, welcome. Hello. Fania, I wanted to begin by asking you about the town you grew up in, Koretz. Can you tell us what you remember of Koretz before the war? Oh, I remember very vividly. It was a very beautiful town, a Jewish town, a Zionistic town, and a cultural town, full of culture. And um, we did have we had many, don't forget. We had, uh, even though we were uh, um, not that religious, but uh, secular, but we did have the, the, the big gracious shield, the big shul, we had the, uh, the, the Garbarski shield, we had Gornstein shield, and then we had classes. We had shoes for the, for the shoemaker, shoes for the tailors. So it was, it was, it was something, it's a beautiful, and we had, we had many schools. We had a Hebrew school, private, Bet Sefer, Tarbut, and we had a Polish school and a Ukrainian school. So um, I happened to be one of the lucky ones. I had very good parents. I don't know if they were wealthy or not, because as children, we weren't supposed to know. Our children, we, we were supposed to be seen but not heard, and our job was to go to school. And I was lucky to be in a tarbut, in a private Hebrew school, which all the things, all the, uh, uh, you know, we, in Hebrew and Polish. So even math we had in Hebrew and math in Polish. And the, the geography and the tzionut and the, about Israel, this, and in our town was the Akshara. The Akshara, this, it means to get used to it. Those days, they went to Israel on a certificate to Israel. So many certificates were allowed to get into Israel. So they, there was Halutzim, and they were in our town, they getting ready to, um, to work the land. And to, so it was, it was, it's very hard to explain because it it was all the heart in the Shoma. The whole your soul was before Zionist for Israel. And the Sri was going in school. Even in grade two was Achvarakibrit, only Hebrew. It was a good Yehuda, whoever. So could qualify for it. That was like a qualify. And then Saturday was a job we had a Lishka. Lishka is like a, a little office, whatever. They rented a room 
somewhere. And we turn it up with all the Israeli songs and dancing the horrors. I knew when I came to Israel, I could visualize, I knew where I was because the Mapat Israel, the, the map of Israel, we were, I could visualize it all. That's how much it was instilled in us, Zionism. Wow. You know, yeah. And now Koretz was in Poland when you were growing up and it's now in Ukraine. Was the town a sort of even mix of Poles and Ukrainians? Yeah. We had Poles with Ukrainian and Jewish people. We were over 5,000 Jewish people which lived in the center of the town and some Polish people with us. Around town were the Poles and the mostly Ukrainian. It calls the Hutter and Nove Miasto, the new city. And the Ukrainian, they owned the, the land, but East, uh, Ukraine that time was, whoever had five hectares land was a very rich farmer because it's very productive. It's a black, the black earth, Chanezion, black earth. So it was very, very uh, a mixed, a mixed town. But the Jews were together because we were most of them Jews lived in town. So yeah. Now I know later in the war, you your neighbors really turned on you. But but in the years before the war started, did you have warm relations with people of, of different backgrounds in your community? Yes, we did. We did very much with the neighbors. Well, there was anti-Semitism, not after 35, you know, when um, we had a very, very good leader in Poland, um, Pilsudski, Marshal Pilsudski. After he died in 35, it turned very bad for the Jewish people, but that with the government and all that, but with the neighbors, we lived in harmony. Well, we didn't go out of the, out of the town because they threw stones on us, you know, and that's all we heard, the jid, 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 you know, jid parhati, dirty Jew and, uh, you know, but, um, but being in town, we were very free, you know, see. Now, the war began when you were in seventh grade and Russian forces occupied Koritz and your family tried at first to flee eastward into Russia. Can you tell us about what happened? Well, in 1939, September 1st, when the war broke out, we, were, we went to speak, to sleep with Poland, because Poland, we used to make fun. You wouldn't understand, Poland. Ritz pro Rekel, back pro Bekel, because Ritz was, uh, Ritz Schmigli was that time, the, the president, whatever. And Beck was in the government, and in Polish it's a reason Beck, Beck where it's. And um, so we made fun. How a country, I remember that my mother used to say, how can a country exist two weeks and, and be uh, conquered? So we went to sleep with the, with the Polish people, with the Polish army, woke up with the Russian. My mother said with the Bolshevik. So we uh, we were taken over by the Russia in 1939. And life was very good. Well, they, they did send some people in Sabir, the Kulaki, the rich people. So, because uh, they wanted a socialistic country, one else. But we were children. What did I, we know? We went to school and we, to me, Stalin was the father of Stalin, you know? And, uh, we were pioneers, and we Russian songs, and Murashila was the hero. So uh, it was a, a quite a good life under the Russians. We did it very good till 41, when the war started. And did you stay in Jewish school under the Russians, or they converted the, the school to a different ideology? No, they didn't. They, they, I went out from the Jewish school. My mother took me out because... Uh, she figured out she herself is from Russia. So we should send it to the Russian school. But the Hebrew school turns into a Jewish school. So it was a Jewish language, everything. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. But they opened up the, the, the school. They opened up one of the uh, Polish schools turned into a Russian school. But they still have a Ukrainian. They didn't have a Polish. 
instead a Ukrainian, a Jewish, and a Russian school. I went to the Russian school. So. Now, under the, your, the two years that you spent under Russian occupation, your family had an opportunity to flee eastward into Russia, and, and you decided to take that risk. What, can you tell us about the decision? We were two years under the Russia, mm -hmm. 39 September and 1941. In June 22nd, when the war broke out with, uh, with Germany, the, so as the German started to, to come in, the war broke out. The Russians, because it was still the border between us, and now town was on the border, and told us the first they evacuated their own people. And then they say, come with us. So we did, we did back up because they were still bombing. Even our town was bombed, you know. I remember once Sukhanik and he died, it was from, from a bomb. So they took us to, we went by horse and wagon those days, you know, we didn't have, and we went as far as Jitomir. And then the propaganda was there, that they're killing, uh, that um, people are dying in Russia of hunger. And uh, so I remember my father said, this I'll never forget the, the slogan, the death of the sword is easier than death of hunger. And you figure out that, uh, uh, you know, the society, the German society, that's such, they, they would do nothing to us. That's so, so educated, so advanced. So, because he remembers yet from Franz Joseph's times. Franz Joseph was in, in Austria, but he always talked about Franz Joseph. So, uh, so he says, you know what? Why would we go into land when we'll die of hunger? Let's go back. They're nice people. They won't do nothing to us. They'll be nice. That's why we returned. Many people returned. How, much, how many of the Jews in your town chose to go eastward with you uh, fleeing the German occupation? Do, do you remember? I mean, were you a couple? Yeah, no, I don't know how many, but quite a few with the wagons. To me, it seems like many people. I couldn't give you a number because from our town, many of them were taken into the army, you know, when the, the, the war started. They were mobilized. The men were mobilized. And uh, quite a few people. That's thank God we've got the Sherita Plita, the remnants of the Jewish people that later survived. And they came, they came to to Israel. Thank God for them. Yeah, you know. So, so, so you started to flee, but but hearing propaganda about hunger in the Soviet Union, you turned around. You turned around. We came back. Now, when you returned to Koritz, it was a very different place than when you had left. Oh, we came to hell, to hell. We didn't recognize our neighbors. Our neighbors turned all on us because you see, they, they promised them, this is Samastino Ukraine, independent Ukraine. So, Independent Union providing to kill the Jews, and unify. And uh, Ukraine was never, in history, Ukraine was never independent. And yet they'll get independence. Mm -hmm. So we were in their way. At, at that age, it must have been confusing for you to come back to a place that you had lived in your whole life and suddenly have such different relationships with your neighbors. My dear, those days, we didn't have psychologists and psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. Those days, we did what we had to do. And that's it. Well, I, we, sure, we found a difference. I found a difference between our neighbors. But uh, that's what it is. If it's bad or good, we have to do it, and that's it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what it is. It is what it is. 
But once you returned to Koritz, how else did life change under German occupation? That's a question. We, be, we don't became people, we came, they, they treat us like subhuman. It took us, first of all, it, it was Gata uh, Yudnarat, um, which is a community council. And then the Ukrainians had their own militia, police, and also the Jewish police, which was under the Yudnarat. And they were going from house to house and asking one day, one day the, the Germans used to come in and say that they need so much gold or so much silver. So the, the, the Ukrainian police used to come with burlap sacks and said, look, so get for, for silver, all the silver cutlery, anything we had of silver, we gave it to them. Those days, we didn't realize they're buying a day of life. You know, they wanted, we gave it to them. Mm -hmm. And they took us, and every day we had to go to work. There's no such a thing. You went to work, you worked in the, on the Strassemester, on the, on the roads. We had, a, we had a refinery, sugar refinery, sugar in, in our town, which was very well known. It supplies sugar over all Poland. Mm -hmm. So we had to go work there. And we had to go and uh, work in the, in the synagogues, where they turn the synagogues into stables, to put the horses. And for that, we got 100 grams of bread a day. So that's how it turned. How did it how how did it work each day when you were when you left home to go to work? Did you know where you were heading each day, or would they randomly assign you? No. The first day we had to we came to the Yudnarat. Every day we had to come to the Yudnarat, and they assigned us. And for bread, we used to get up. I was a child, so I used to get up three o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and stay in line for bread. So, and uh, there used to be the daylight out of it with, with whips or a truck would come in with a lineup with, and, and kill a few people, just drive in. It was, uh, it was horrible. But um, many times he came home with all bread, but my mother used to, I used to come home and um, cold and so on. So the next day, my mother put my brother's jacket on me, a big one, put books in the front, books in the back, tied with a rope. And that's the way I, uh, and one time I stayed and came by the door. He said, Schluss, no more bread. So that day we didn't ever go have bread and they took us to work. And I didn't come home, God knows till when. And I was, and, my, my, my father, by that time, we lost our father. We didn't know where he was. So she was, um, she was so happy to see me that, uh, that she didn't mind if we broke bread or not. Mm. So you were the, the designated member of your family to stand in the bread ration line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the one. I wouldn't let my mother go. Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't let her go. Were there other children waiting in line with you? Yeah, most of them, yeah. Hmm. You know, children, we weren't children. We were already grown up, what do you want? When you're the age of 14, you're not a child. Hmm. We grew and, up overnight. And you, you were not in school anymore because you were working? Oh, no, 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 no school. There's definitely, <laughs> for the Jewish people, school. Hmm. No. You mentioned that your father was taken away. This it was September 1941, right? That was a, a, uh, It was in September. It was a prochista. You know, it's a holiday Ukrainian prochista. Don't quote me if it's a September or August, whatever. We knew by those days it was prochista. And uh, so I was walking with my father, and. Uh, 
we were walking to Shoemaker when Pavlovsky, when Rechka come over to him and says, Yoshka, come to work. You know, my father's name was Yoshka in Jewish. We called him Yoshka, Ukrainians. Come to work. And a guy that we knew so well. And, uh, and he says, go home and tell Mad I'll be in the evening home. Because it was very normal. They grab people to go to work and then they return. And they never returned. And that was the end. That was the last. It's of my father till I found the grave after the war. How did you find out what happened to him later on? Well, that was in 92. Hmm. In 91, when Ukraine became independent, and I was there in 92. Yeah. So for 50 years, you, you didn't know what had become of your father? No, we knew where they took them hmm. later by rumors. But uh, later we found the graves of all the people, wow. for 350 people. Fanny, I know this is a very dark part of her story, but it, uh, it's around this time that the killing actions began in your town and you, uh, you lost your mother as well. Can you tell us about that? It was a... We, mother woke me up one morning it was Erev Shavuot. And she said, there's so many people on the streets left. We'll, we'll go out. We'll go out. We'll see what's going on. And we went out. No sooner we went out when a policeman grabbed us, a militia. And we were going in, in line. It wasn't line. It was uh, in Ukraine, Sigromada. It was a mess of people. You know, just we're walking. But at the sides, along with us, were, were the police, the Ukrainian police, and the gendarme, the, the Russians, and not the Russians, pardon me, the, the Germans were going with, uh, with rifles and with guns. And they marched us like this. And nobody, there's one lady would step out of the line. But shoot, she ran away the shot, shot her. And that's how we marched us down to the <coughs> Monastirsky Street to, um, to Feldman's house. It was a big house. And down there, they have to take off the coats and the, the clothes, you know, like scarves, any loose clothing and jewelry. They were, oh, telling you. There were dishes of jewelry, months of clothes, unbelievable. And that's how we walked out and, uh, and we stood down there. And after a while, they told us to go to the market. And while we were going there on the market, we were staying down there. And it was packed with people, packed thousands. So they, uh, a German went over and he said, he pointed with the finger, you, you, you. Till now I can stand that somebody points with the finger. Isn't that funny? You, 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 and pointed to me and asked how old I am. So I started to say 40. My dumb mother pushed me, she's 16, and pushed me. And I went back, but he grabbed me by my arm, yanked me very hard. And that was the last I saw my mother. Yeah. So she saved your life by telling the officer that you were 16. Yeah. Yeah. She, she saved my life. Yeah. Now when, the... when she pushed you forward and said you were 16 and you were yanked off to the side, where, what happened then? Then they, they went back a street. And this is the house of Kleiner, Kleiner's house. In our place, when Shavuot, they have Shavuot, we ordered to go to the river to bathe. It was nice and warm already. So we all sat on the ground. And we were waiting. 
who were just waiting there. In the meantime, they had men on one side and us women on the other side. And we were waiting and we heard in the meantime in front our wagons going by wagons with people, elderly people on it. And we heard some boom shooting, like boom, 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 boom from far away. And, uh, and while we were sitting, we saw a scene that this is something that will be always, always in my mind. Like, I don't have to know a calendar when Shavuot comes. A few days, a few weeks, a week or two before Shavuot, I can feel it, I can see it in my mind, everything. That would happen, such a scene that I don't wish on no one to go that through. Because we had a woman, Lake, in our town, and she was a little bit, I wouldn't say crazy, no. She was a little bit mentally, not stable. So the Germans, I'll never forget, turned to her and says, dance, Leia dance. So she danced. Leia say, hi, Hitler. Heil Hitler, she did exactly what they told her. And she had a two-year-old child. So the, the Germans on both sides, Nazis, God, Nazis, because a human person wouldn't do it with the mind, took and they played ball with the child, they were throwing the child one to another. And she was jump, jumping in the front to catch the child. And she couldn't, they, by the end, they took the child by one end, it was a fence, and they threw the child against the fence. The head hit the fence. Everything spattered. Blood. Okay. We're speechless. <laughs> Not that we could speak, but it's... This is something that's, it's very hard to, to explain or understand or to visualize it. It was horrible, just horrible. That's the way we sat like this till about four o'clock and then says, go home. That's it. They had a job to be done. It was a nine to four job and they did it. And we went home, what home? And to say the next day, report to the Yudnagat. So that's what we did. I went home, what home? I didn't have a home. I don't know what to go to, but anyway. And in one day, everything was wiped out. The whole family, no one, when all was left. All in one day, ever Shavuot. Oh, fine. Yes. Mom. Mm -hmm. When did you understand what had happened to your mom? Was it right away? Well, we knew right away wow. that that they were they, they killed him. But the next day, we came to the Yudnagat. First of all, I didn't have no one, and I went to my next door neighbor. She chased me out. I'm a dirty Jew. She was like my second mother. Get out of here, you dirty Jew. I begged her that name. So we went to the Yudnagant. And they sent us to the, uh, they, they marched us so, so many people. And we came to a place named Kazakh. We came there, three massive graves with people on it and told us to, they were so cruel to cover up the graves, to cover. There was no blood, nothing. So we covered through, through dirt. And we were going, and then, I found my mother's scarf there, inside the grave. 
and then we came, we came to the Yudnarat and they told us we go to a ghetto. It was, the ghetto wasn't The ghetto wasn't um, with no walls from the ghetto. They they took two or three street, which called the street and part of the side street, and they closed. They didn't close off, but I mean that was the ghetto, because in our town, if somebody walk out, everybody knew everybody, even the Ukrainians. You know, it was a small town. And then, then we had to go the next day too. The next day we went down there, you looked on the ground. It was little, I don't know how to explain it. It's when you look on a map and you look rivers on a map very narrow, that's like thread run through and that was with blood. But the third day when we came, the ground moved. And we kept coming many days. I don't even know how many days. It was seven kilometers we had to go up there and back. How many days? I couldn't tell you. I don't remember. I just don't remember how many days we had to cover the graves. Anya, 80 years later, I can see how hard it is to tell the story. We really are, are grateful that you're doing it for us. I cannot remember how many days, but then we were in the ghetto. It was very, very hard in the ghetto. Why are, you returning, why are you returning each day to the killing site? Were there more killings each, each day that you had no, to- No, but it was such massive grave, we had to cover them up. We couldn't do it in one day or two mm -hmm. days. Took many days to cover up the grave. And I just couldn't, couldn't realize how the people were laid so flat. It took me 70 years till I read the book, Holocaust by Bullet, written by Father Dubois. And that helped my eyes. I couldn't figure out how. Did they go down and put a bullet into each person or so on? And he explained in the book, Father de Bois, that they got girls from the field, which trampled on them, and then put some tweaks so that I knew, because when they shot them, they shot them in the back and they fell into the grave. So, so that's why it took a long, long time. Many days I went. And I don't think I even cried. I just don't know. Everybody was in the same situation. Everybody went, whom are you going to complain to? But I was a disease. Nobody wanted me beside them. I was the only one. This one had a cousin. This one had an uncle. This one had someone. I didn't have no one. So all the time that I was went through the war, I was nothing but a disease to everyone. Nobody wanted me around because I was a burden to everyone. But somehow when there's a will, there's one lady, when I came to the ghetto, from the ghetto, Pasha, this I'll never forget, may she rest in peace. I came over to her. She used to deliver milk to the house. So I came over to her out from the ghetto. I got myself out of the ghetto. And I came over to her and I said, Pashinka, I'm so hungry. So she said, she went in the back and took out a package. And she says, when everybody robbed the houses, because when I came home, every, our house was empty. So she said, I knew in school you were knitting a sweater. So I picked up a few things, just in case somebody survived, so you left something. So she gave me this package, which it was a sweater and a few things to wear. And she said to me, 
your mother came to me in my dreams and she's so happy there. The only thing, it's wet for her, it's from your tears. So I said to her, Pashika, I promise I won't cry. She gave me bread and that time now it's yogurt that I was on And she told me, please don't come no more. Of course, her life was also in danger. And, uh, but her words kept me going. So I told her, I promise you, Pashinka, I'll survive. I never thought I'd ever dreamt of surviving. I says, I'll not leave Hitler and I'm going to come and see you. And you know what? I cry now, but I never cried. I was hard as a rock because I wanted my mother to be dry for her. When was the first time you cried for this, for your mom? When I was liberated. I never cried till I was liberated. I never cried. I was as hard as a rock. So after the killings, Fania, you were forced into a ghetto, which is where you had this conversation with Pasha. How long were you in the ghetto before you escaped? The ghetto was the ghetto was from Erev Sukkot to Erev Shavuot, from the you know from the from the Pentecost day to the Tabernacle days. Those are the two killings indeed. And not only in our town, look, we didn't have a communication like we have now, or even 50, not even 20 years ago. So they all did the same in every town at the same time. So, um, so it was Erev Shavuot when it, we had the second killing, the second shkita, because we had some quite a few people left, not quite a few people, because the minute they know what was going on, they heard us. So people had, had we had attics, so they pulled up the ladder up in the attics or in the basement, they were hidden. And after four o'clock, they were free already. So, but after a while, when after the killing, the Ukrainians were bring, flashing out some Jewish when they found a Jew. They gave them two kilos salt. Can you imagine? But that's all they were worth was two kilos salt. They mm -hmm. sold us for two kilos salt. And in 1942, it was unified. That's it. Nobody knew about us. It was all the killing was done. By 1942. And Sukkot, that's it. We were finished. No Jews. <laughs> So by Shavuot, which would have been spring 1943, you, es you escaped the ghetto because there was a... a oh, no, 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 42, that's, that was Shavuot, was the first Shrita mm -hmm. killing. The second, the same year, Er Shavuot. Mm -hmm. We were only six months between Shavuot and Sukkot. We were in the ghetto. And then was the killing, the last. Since we just passed Sukkot, that was 79 years ago now. Okay. Fania, at, at some point after you had been in the ghetto for a couple months and there was the second killing, you, you fled into the forest and then you were there for 18, 18, 18. months. Yeah. How did you survive in the forest? Well, you survive. You know, but there's a will, there's no other way. You have to survive, you know. So, um, you'd be surprised. By the time I come to the forest, I was already, at the beginning, I was at a, a Senanju. I went into, I stayed in a house. I stayed in a house, I slept in the bar and I ate from rocks. What's going on? It looks like Fanya just dropped off the Zoom, but she should be back with us in a moment. So please sit tight and we'll, we'll make sure to 
finish her story as she survives in the forest and is liberated. Uh, after finding talks about liberation, we'll open the floor for audience questions. So please feel free to start thinking about those questions now and sharing them in Zoom Q&A box. And we'll get to as many as we can uh, in the last 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you all. I have to say, we, you know, we work with a lot of Holocaust survivors at the museum and I have the great honor and privilege of speaking with many of them. But Fanya's story really is unique. There are so few testimonies of these kinds of mass shootings in the Far East. So it, it's just amazing that we are able to speak with her and it's clear how emotional this is so much later. Fanya, welcome back. And we just need to unmute you before we continue. Yeah. And thanks again to Marnie at the Calgary Jewish Federation for making all this possible. Fanny, can you hear me? Yeah. So, um, Fanny, I, I want to turn to audience questions in a few minutes, but but um, finish your story before then. So you you survived in the forest, and then how did you find out that you were liberated? I did find out a big pardon. What, what happened during liberation? Did you see Russian soldiers? Oh, no. When I was liberated, there was came over a, a gypsy man. You see, when they, the Russian, when they came in any place, they came in and they, they used to send out a, I should look it up up they call in Russia, Rosvetka. They're sending out a, to check out, how would you call it? To check out what's going on, if it's safe for them to come in or whatever, you know. And it, to see if the coast is clear. Anyway, they came in. And uh, so the first thing I jumped, I says, I'm not Jewish, I'm not Jewish. I was dressed in rags. I was full of lies. I was full of scabs. I was something really subhuman and he said to me don't worry I says we are liberated we're from the russian army but i mean he was dressed you know in, in not in a uniform and he had a piece of parachute i don't know he tore a piece of cloth from the parachute wrapped me around gave me a hug <sighs> And he said, you don't have to worry. And he took me to the village. And down there was the Russian army. They were dancing, they were rejoicing. Wow. So uh, that's how it was liberated. Wow. Now, at, your brother had survived the war this whole time separately from you because he had fake papers. Yeah. How was he able to arrange that, but your, the rest of your family wasn't? He, he was working with the, the, with the Germans, and a German made it for him, mm. for him and his wife. It's Anita's mother. She looks like a Volksdeutsche. She looked with blonde blue eyes. It was a beauty. And for the two of them, survived in Kiev under Aryan papers. A non-Jewish papers, yeah. So when, when you were liberated, you went to go find him? No, I didn't know he was alive. I didn't know. I just met him in Kovac. We were liberated. We started to go back to the few people that were in the, in the forest, even though they, they lived in the neighboring towns. We all decided, because Kovac was the center, was the... So they decided to go to Kovac. So we started, our journey started to walk to Kovac. And uh, we walked. It was all this spring, it was in April. I don't know in what day of April I was liberated. Mm. I couldn't even tell you. I know it was in April and we started to go. And it wasn't that easy because the, the river was frozen. It wasn't frozen, but that sluice never freezes. The, the bridge was bombed, we couldn't go over. So we had to go all the way around to Novograd Olivsk and then to Kovac. So when I came to Kovac, I met my brother 
on the street. You believe it? And then to live through the war and be killed because for one reason, because he was a Jew. Your brother was killed by Ukrainian nationals but, after the war. But, but when they were just, yeah, after the war. I mean, the war was still going on in, in uh, the West, but he was killed. We were in East, in the East. Mm. And he was killed for one reason, because he was a Jew by the Bederovce. You all, you know. And now he's in their him. Would you believe it? He's their hero, mm. in Dera. Yeah, nationalist. Anya, in a moment we'll turn to the audience, but I wanna ask you one last question. This story is so challenging to tell, but you keep doing it again and again with such commitment. Why do you tell this story? What do you want people to take away from it? It's not only now for 40 years, it's close to 40 years. And even with Father Dubois, I tracked him down and I met him in, in Detroit because he was the one that was in our town in the book I read. And from what I say, I even have now I can show you, I've got proof that nobody knows about me. I never got good machung. Nobody knew about us. We're not registered, no place. There's no documentation. So, and that's all I hear, Auschwitz, Auschwitz, Auschwitz. What's about respect to our Eastern people? What's about respect to the one that laid the graves under the unknown? And as much as I speak to schools and so on, if I don't have a number, and if I wasn't, wasn't in, a, in a concentration camp, my town, my classmate, my relatives, my parents, the old, old Rolling all the little towns around, Rovno, Kovac, Mejirac, Bresna, Dubno, Selish, all of them, they don't count the people. And all Eastern Europe, nothing is mentioned about them. That was, we had a hidden Holocaust. They killed us just before they opened up the crematorium, crematoriums. Even with Father Dubois, when he spoke, something didn't register to the people. And that's why God gave me a long life for a reason. They can't talk. I'm their voice. Not very many people of us left. We're the voice I, for so many of you. I'm their voice. And that's why I think they know, should know what happened in Eastern Europe in the little towns, which no one knows. No one knows. Well, thank you for helping to put the Holocaust by bullets on the map, to educate about it. And I wanna remind the audience that today's program is being recorded. So we do hope you'll share this recording and some of the other resources that we send out by email to help learn and teach about this untold chapter of the Holocaust. Vanya, there's an audience question about the USC Shoah Foundation project that you just wrapped up where they're turning you into a hologram. What, what was that like? Well, that is that the God, God no, they gave me a long life. I always say I'm going to live till 150. I'll live forever. So people shouldn't forget. They shouldn't forget because I absolutely forget that history repeats itself. You know, history is being rewritten and they rewrite history. So this way, I'm sure that someone, someone, someday, whoever comes to a museum or in the schools, interested to be, they, they bring students to the museum. I don't know, to tell you the honest truth, I don't know how it exactly works. But I know one thing, they will remember that the Holocaust did happen and it should never, never, never happen again. It's for the future generations to know that this should never happen. It shouldn't have happened and it should never happen again. 
let's hope. And through the, this program that's turning your story into a hologram, that message about never again will reach people for generations. Thank you. I hope so. Was it, uh, what was it like for you to participate in something that was so high tech and, and uh, new? Well, I can tell you one thing, I'm 94. I'm not that high in high tech, but I'm not that low in high tech either. So, so it's amazing. It was just amazing what they can do. It's amazing. Well. It is amazing. And uh, my, my understanding is that uh, the hologram won't be ready for several months, they have to process and edit it, um, but we'll share information about the Dimensions and Testimony program with our audience in, uh, in a follow-up email. We were told it takes between eight months to a year, so let's go. Bonnie, I think we should wrap up here, but I, we are so grateful to you for, for spending this time with us and sharing your story with us. We're grateful to the Calgary Jewish Federation for partnering with us today. And uh, we hope our audience remembers your lesson uh, about the Holocaust by bullets. Uh, by listening to you, we become witnesses to the story of your family and community. Thank you. Everything that we do with the Museum of Jewish Heritage to preserve stories like Fania's and other Holocaust survivors is made possible through donor support. So we are very grateful to our audience members who have supported the, mu the museum and uh, we, you can learn more about the museum and join us for upcoming events at the links in the Zoom chat. As I mentioned, we'll send an email out tomorrow to everyone who's with us today with a recording and some additional resources. We hope everyone stays healthy and safe. Fania, we hope we get to welcome you to the museum in person in New York someday soon. Thank you. I, I'm looking forward to it. Goodbye, with Fania and Dahlia. <laughs> well, that sounds great. <laughs> Take care, everyone.